edition of The Teaching Lady. Thank you for stopping by. We are starting a study titled 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. Now, some of you may be familiar with this study. I recorded it several years ago, but one of the problems we noticed that there are some sound issues. And so I decided now is a good time to re-record these lessons because now I feel is when we really need to be in the Word more than ever before, based on everything that's happening around us. And part of the reason why people won't go into the Word of God is because they don't understand the Word of God. And this study is going to give us a brief overview of how the Bible is set up. Now, I'm not going to talk specifically about what scriptures mean, because that's not the purpose of this study. I'll let a pastor do that or a preacher do that. But I'm going to try and help you understand how the Bible is set up so that when you're listening to a sermon or a teaching out of the Bible, you can understand where to find the book that they're referring to, what kind of book it is, maybe the location of where it took place, uh, who the author was, uh, that will help you be able to enjoy it better. And I think it'll be less stressful also. Well, before we go ahead and get started, if you haven't hit the subscribe button, please do so. Hit the bell notification so that you can get notification of when I do lesson number two. Well, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer, and then we're going to jump into 30 days to understanding the Bible. Father, I just thank you for this lesson. I thank you for this book that Max wrote. I know, Lord, it was so beneficial to me when I've read it to be able to understand your word. It just opened my Bible reading world up. And I just thank you for that. I thank you for his dedication. And I just ask you would bless our time together now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, to understand how the Bible is set up, we kind of need to know some things about it. Some simple things. I remember I was in a class years ago when I was first exposed to this study. And I was sitting with about 15 to 20 senior adults. And these ladies and guys had been in church all their life. And they were near and dear friends of mine that I just admired for their biblical wisdom and their understanding of God's Word. But one of the things that I found out is when we all opened up this book and started to do this and look at the questions, they didn't know the answers any more than I did. And I was just shocked. And together we had such a great time of being excited about learning the information on the Bible that we didn't know. I mean, it was just fascinating to me that they didn't know that. But not everybody sits around and looks at that type of information. Mainly, they go in and they start reading it. Well, you need to know, and one of the first things we talk about, and we ask that the um, guy in the book says, is to, to understand it, okay? We need to understand some things about it. And he gives an example, and he says, there's this guy who's a well-known engineer in town. And there was a company that was having a problem with their machines, and they couldn't find it. They, they had their best techs trying to find this, this problem with their machines. So they called this guy out, and they said, hey, can you come out? We're having an issue. Uh, can you help us locate it? We hear you're the best in the biz, right? So he goes out there. He spends about an hour. And he finds the spot on the equipment, and he takes a piece of chalk, and he just marks an X right there, and he says, this is your problem. And they go, no, no, that can't be. Really? And they go, that's it right there. And he goes, okay. So they take it apart. Sure enough, that's the problem. Well, they're ecstatic. They're all like, we can't believe it. You found it. I mean, we've overlooked this. How many times? We, we, we would have never found this on our own. Send us a bill. And he goes, well, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. And he sends them a bill for $10,000. And they're like, what? $10,000? You're only here for an hour. Like, we need an itemization. We need you to itemize this. What could be worth $10,000? I'll send you an itemization. One chalk mark. One dollar. 
knowing where to put the chalk mark, $9,999. See, when we're looking at the Bible, if we know some of the information, it makes a huge difference, right? Well, first question we have that the author points out to us or asks us, he said, how many divisions are there? Now, well, I've taught this study a few times in a, um, a setting in church with uh, ladies, with groups of ladies. And I asked that question, I'm like, how many divisions are there? And they all said, in the divisions. Well, let's see, there's, and you get, you get all kinds of answers thrown out, okay? You'd be surprised to know that there's only two, okay? So we have old and new. Two divisions, that's it. Old Testament, New Testament, okay? That's all, two divisions, two major divisions. Something in my eye. All right, so two major divisions, okay? So if we have two major divisions, how many total books do we have in each? And this question always stumps people because nobody ever stops and counts how many books are in the Old Testament, how many are in the New Testament. But if we look at how many books are in each, then we get a total of how many books are in the Bible. So does anybody want to venture a guess on how many books are in the Old Testament? I'll give you a sec, throw out a few suggestions. Not that I can hear them anyway, but you know, think to yourself. All right, I'm gonna help you. 39, okay. So 39 books in the Old Testament. How many books in the New Testament? <laughs> 27. So if I add 39 and 27 together, I get Try and do this without your phone, okay? I get 66. Now, some people will say, well, my Bible has more than 66. I think the Catholic Bibles have more than 66. There's some books that are in the Catholic Bible that are not in, in the Christian Bible. Uh, those didn't make it into the canon. So, um, Looking at the total number of books, now we have to figure out, okay, what kind of books are in there? And you're, you're like, kind? I, I didn't even realize there was a kind, but there is. And this is key to understanding, it's one of the keys to understanding when you're reading scripture, if you can understand and remember the kind of book that it is, then you'll know what kind of information you're reading. So let's talk about the Old Testament first, okay? What kinds? There's three different kinds. And remember, this is a basic overview. You might get, you might get some commentaries or some scholars that'll say, oh, you know, you need to dive down deeper and there's more than that in there. We're looking at a basic overview of the Bible. So we're going to start with the 39 books in the Old Testament, we're going to break that down three different types, okay? So the first 17 books, and we're talking about from Genesis, which is the first one, going all the way through to the book of Esther, you've got 17 historical books. So 17 history, okay? Now, after Esther, you have Job, and you have Song, and Proverb, and Ecclesi uh, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, or it might be Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. There's five poetical books. Okay, so if we have five and 17 gives us 22 from 39, how many do we have left? If we said we have three types, okay? 17, prophetical or prophecy. All right, so that gives us our 39. All right, 17 history, five poetry, 17 prophecy. Makes a huge difference knowing that so that when you read those scriptures, okay, what would we expect to find in those? Well, if we're reading the historical books, we expect to find 
history of the people. I mean, talking about from Genesis, in the beginning, creation story, the Noah story, Abraham, Joseph, all the way down to Esther, Queen Esther. The history of the people, David, uh, Saul, the judges, the mess that took place, Moses in the desert wandering for 40 years, the history of the Israelite people, okay, all in the history. When you look at the poetry books, when we're starting at Job through to Song of Solomon, those are poetry. And then you have, we expect to find poetry, and then you have the 17 prophetical books you expect to find prophecy. Now, in the 17 prophetical books, I think it's, I think it's neat to know that that's split up two ways, okay? With five of the 17 being by major prophets and 12 being minor prophets. So major dudes like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, you know, minor prophets like Jonah and Amos and Habakkuk and Malachi and Micah, you know, these guys being minor. What's the difference between the two as far as major and minor? Well, biblical commentaries say the length of the book, the number of chapters. So like your minor prophets, the chapters are a lot shorter. The books are a lot, are a lot shorter. Your major prophets, there's more chapters to them. That's essentially what they say is the difference between the two. Now, let's look at your New Testament. We have 27 books there. How are they divided? Three ways, okay? So we have five, history, okay? Those would be the Gospels and the book of Acts. So you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. History books, uh, talking about when Jesus came to the earth as a baby, going through his life, his uh, earthly ministry, his death, his resurrection, right? When Peter uh, and Paul come on the scene, as far as taking the church, going out and building the church. Then you have 13, what we would call Pauline epistles. Those are written by the Apostle Paul. Then you have, so that, what would that get? Let me just do, let's do math, okay? Because we might be older, but we still need to be testing the math here. So 5 and 13 gives us 18. Take away from 27, how many is that? Without using your phone, nine, that's right. Nine general epistles. Now, general epistles, just general letters. And epistles is another word for, it's a fancy word for letter. So you have nine general epistles written by miscellaneous guys, okay? Uh, it is interesting to note that um, John, who wrote the book of John, the Gospel of John, he also penned 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation. Those four letters are in the general epistles. I always think that's an interesting little tidbit when we're talking. So out of the 66, you've got 27 books in the New Testament. You got 39 in the Old. You have for history, okay, of the total Bible, you have 22 historical books in the Bible, okay? It gives you the history of where we come from, the history of mankind, the history of Jesus, the history of all the events, okay? Then you have 17 prophetical books, which makes up about 27% of the Bible, which when you think about it, a lot of churches never bring up prophecy, they never talk about the prophetical books. They might touch on it here or there, but they usually don't dive too deep into the prophecy books for whatever reason. I, I don't know. And then you have the 13 Pauline letters, you have the nine uh, Paul, uh, general epistles, and you have the five poetry books. Uh, one of the poetry books, Song of Solomon, if you're married, check that book out as a married person. Me personally, I'm like, oh, it's a little gooey. 
<laughs> but it's a fun read, right? And obviously God has it in there for a reason. All right, so looking at those, we've, we've looked at two major divisions, 66 books total, 39 old, 27 new. Okay, we've looked at the types of books that they are. Now let's look at the number of authors for each. And the best guess for authorship, because I mean, honestly, we're having to go by biblical scholars and what they know. Uh, Max Anders says that there's 28, okay, 28 authors for the Old Testament, and he had nine, okay, for the New Testament. Then we look at the number of years that these cover, okay, so. The time frame or the time span, I guess you could say, for the Old Testament would be 1,600 years, almost 2,000. I think some scholars say the time span represents almost 2,000 years of history. Okay, so you have almost 2,000 years, okay, plus minus somewhere around there. And then for the New Testament, okay, less than 100. Oops. Less than 100 years for the time span, okay, of the New Testament. So you had 27 books written for the New Testament, and they covered a time span of less than 100 years. And the Old Testament, you had 39 books, and that covered a time span of almost 2,000 years. Now, if we look at, okay, from the time uh, where we are now back to when Jesus died, it's at least 2,000 years, and then you add on another 2,000 years, it's a long time ago, right? From the time that creation first started, you're talking about 4,000? I mean, you have to sit there and do the math, but... It's a long time. I think my point in that is it's not millions and millions and millions, which we hear millions and millions thrown around a lot as far as when mankind started. Uh, if you're a Bible believer, it's not millions and millions and millions. We have to look at, look at that. So we've looked at the divisions. We've looked at the types. We've looked at how many. We've looked at the number of authors. And we've looked at the time span. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is the structure. Okay, so you have of the historical books, 11 are primary history books and six are secondary. The history of Israel is advanced in the 11 primary books and repeated or amplified in the six secondary books, okay? The poetical and the prophetical books were written during the time period that is constructed in the first 17 books. So here's what we're saying, okay? When you're reading the first 17 books of the Bible, okay, and I'll just show you Esther. All right. So here are the first 17 books of the Bible. All right. So when I'm asked to go to Judges, I know if I've done my homework, what kind of book Judges is. It's an historical book. I know it's in the first 17 books. I have no need to go look at all of that. Okay. So when the pastor tells me to go to Judges, I know I'm going towards the front. Okay. If he tells me to go to a poetry book, I know that I'm going somewhere around here. And that's it. Poetry. If I'm going to prophecy, I'm going to somewhere around. Let me just go to here. See? I don't have to look in the front and I don't have to look in the back because of prophecy. I know it's somewhere around here. If I want to go to the Gospels and Acts, I'm only looking through here. I'm not looking in the front and I'm not looking way in the back. If I want to go to Revelation, I know I got to go all the way to the back, right? Now, a lot of Bibles have 
definitions, concordance, maps in the back, measurements, things like that, stuff for additional information. But see, when the pastor tells me to go to a specific verse, it would help if I knew what kind of book it was and if it was Old or New Testament, because then I would know, okay, am I in the front part of the Bible or am I in the back part? Because what ends up happening, and this happened to me all the time, and it was so frustrating that I just said, I give up, is they would tell me, go to a book, and I wouldn't know where it was located, and I wouldn't know what type of book it was. And so then I would go, first thing you go to when you can't find something, table of contents, right? And you start looking, oh, where is it, where is it? And you can't find it because of course you're in a hurry because they're already reading it. They're already making a point about it. And by the time you find it, he's moved on sometimes to another one. And then you're like, okay, now he wants me to go to John and where's John? I think it's new Testament. Okay. Page 884. And you're flipping through where's page 884. <gasps> and he goes, Oh, John 12. Well, that's not on 844. That's on, that's on 898. He's done moved on. I used to get so frustrated by that because by the time I got there, I missed the verse and I missed the point of the verse. And so then I'm like, why, why bring it? These days, and I see this in church, I see this uh, in churches that I have visited. People don't even bring this. They don't even bring their Bible anymore. They just come walking in with their stuff, with their purse, with their family, or if they're a guy, their wallet in their pocket, they got their phone. Okay. But they don't bring their Bible. And pastors know this because they look out into the crowd and they don't see the Bibles. And even if they have them in the pew in front of them, they don't pick them up and open them up and read them. Now, why is that? Is it because people go, well, he talks too fast. And by the time he tells me to find a passage, I can't find it. And then he's moved on. And then I've missed part of the message. Or is it because they don't have an interest in bringing their Bible? They figure, well, he's telling me what it says, so I take his word for it. Why do I need to bring my Bible, right? And the pastors go, why should I stop and wait for people to open their Bible? They haven't brought their Bible to church, so there's no point in me stopping and waiting for them, right? I used to take my Bible with me all the time. Because when he would tell me, go to John 8, okay, I want to see what you're reading. And I want to see if it matches mine. I want to see if we say the same thing, okay? And I want to see for myself. I want to read out of the Word of God myself. And I want to take notes on it, right? But I realize that not everybody wants to do that. And depending on what church you go to, you're either going to see everybody bring their Bible, or you're going to see nobody bring their Bibles, or you might see one or two. I, rem I remember when I first started going to this church, there was, oh, a thousand people. It probably... A good thousand people attended this church. I walked in with my Bible. I get out of my car, start walking with my Bible, and I'm looking around going, nobody else has got their Bibles. Like, wow, okay. I felt like a fish out of water. When I walked in there, I'm like, I'm the only one carrying a Bible in here. Like, are we at church? Why aren't you carrying your Bible? Right? Do they own one? I mean, I, I don't know. Most people own one. Most people own more than one. And I, I used to tell a uh, Sunday school class that I taught years ago, I said, if everybody went like this and blew the dust off this thing, what a massive dust storm that would be, right? Because we've let it sit and collect dust. We've piled things on top of it. We've We've put it on our coffee table and we've Look at that, my Bible. But we've never opened it up. I had one lady tell me one time, she goes, I don't know what the red letters mean in the New Testament. What are, what are those? Those are Jesus' words. Oh, I didn't know that. She'd been in church all her life and never knew because she'd never opened up the Bible for herself. See, we need to be in God's Word more than ever more than ever if you're paying attention to what's going on in the world not just here but going on in the world in the countries that are named in this book so far i haven't found america named in here and so have a, a, a lot of other bible commentators and a lot of pastors cannot find america named in here 
It's all overseas. It's all Middle East. And those countries that are named in here, we need to be paying attention to what's going on with them today because some of it is prophetical, which is in here, right? So it's important that we understand how the Bible is set up, where the book is, because that will help us greatly. I know it helped me. It helped me tremendously be able to understand. And here's the other point I want to make to you that he doesn't make, that the author doesn't make, but something that I learned was that the Bible is this the Bible is not written in chronological order as to how it happened. Okay. Yes, we start out with in the beginning. Okay. And Revelation ends with this is it. It's over. Okay. Jesus has returned. He's, he's in charge now. New kingdom, new heavens, new earth, right? But in between, in between those two bookends, it's not written in chronological order. It's written in this order, okay? The history, the poetry, the prophecy, the history, the Pauline, the general. If you want to read it in chronological order as to how all of this happened, then you need to buy a chronological Bible, and that will put the events in order as they happened. That's a pretty cool story. You could also read it on version. I'm reading the Chronological Bible on version right now. I've read it before, hard copy. Now I'm reading it again with some folks in a group uh, going through and reading. Because people will say to me, and I, and I know and I was one of the ones to say this too, I'm reading the history, and just like Max Anders points out, that when you're reading the history, you may read the poetry and the prophecy, things that sound familiar to you that you read in history. Well, that's because they were written during the historical time period, right? That's huge. That is huge to me because I'm... One of the things I, uh, I used to say when I was first reading it before I, before I read this book was, why am I reading the same thing again? I felt like I just read this and now I'm reading it again. And there's 11,000 chapters, 11,000 plus chapters in the Bible. So, you know, why do I have to read this again? Well, it's because I first read it from an historical point of view. Now I'm reading it from a prophetical point of view about the same thing. See what I'm saying? So when we understand that, we go, ah. When we understand that poetry and prophecy were written during the time of the history, it all makes sense. And you just go, what? Mind blown. Okay, now I get it, right? Prior to that, I was like, here we go again. I just, I just read this. Uh, Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles in particular. I felt like I was reading the same thing again that I just read in Second Samuel. Okay, But knowing that these little tidbits is very helpful when it comes to reading the Word of God. So next time we are together, we're going to look at the land. We're going to have a map on the board. We're going to talk about geography because it's important that we know, okay, when we're reading to get a picture of where this happened, to see the land on a board, the world map of the biblical lands, to get an idea, especially when you're talking about, you know, for instance, when the Babylonians came in and they took the Israelites, uh, the, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, which had already been taken over by the Assyrians, when the Babylonians came in and they took that over and they exiled the people. Listen, they didn't just put them in a car and drive them down the street and say, okay, we're here, get out. No, they came from across the land, hundreds of miles is what's estimated, to the uh, Jerusalem and Judea, took those people, exiled them, and they all went back, walking. There was no planes, no trains, no automobiles, but walking. So when you see that on a map and you go, wow, those people walked from here to here. 
and they spent 70 years in, in uh, Babylonian exile, okay, in exile with the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar, all right, and then when, when old Neb died and the grandson had taken over, Belshazzar, and then he was killed, all right, he died, and Cyrus, I think it was King Cyrus, came back into play, came onto the scene. He said, y'all could go home. Well, you think about, all right, I've been in exile for 70 years. I'm old. I'm not walking all the way back to Jerusalem to reestablish the city. And some people didn't go. They stayed behind in Babylon. Either they couldn't make the journey, they liked the lifestyle, who knows. But when, you th when you're reading the story and you understand that there's some distance between those two cities and they walked it across desert lands, there's no amenities, there's no rest stops like we know, right? These are the things that if we understand those things, it makes the Bible come more alive. And we get a deeper appreciation for what the people went through. And for, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm going, I'm very thankful for my automobile. I'm thankful I don't have to walk hundreds of miles. I'm thankful I don't have to go out into the middle of a field and get water and tote it all the way back to my house, to my mud hut. I'm so thankful for water that comes out of the sink. Because when I look at how they lived back in Bible times, go dig a well and go all the way out to the well, which might be miles from where they were, to carry the water back to their camp, I'm going, thank you, Lord, for water. Thank you. Right? It's just little things like that, understanding the geography of the land of Bible times, of what's in the Bible. So when you read the words of those places, you go, oh, I know, I have a pretty good idea of where that's at now. And the fact that some of them are very recognizable by their names today, right? Some of them still exist today as they existed, that name as it existed in biblical times. So it's pretty interesting, pretty cool stuff. All right, well, I'm going to stop here. Let me go ahead and close this out in prayer. And I hope to see you for session number two. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Maybe you want to do a study with some friends and you think maybe this would be a good study for them. Um, please tell them about it. You know, tell somebody about it. It's okay. I don't mind. Um, remember, it's a basic overview and we're not going to be digging into scriptures and trying to understand their meanings. That's for someone else on another time. Right now, my whole thing is to just help you understand how the Bible is set up so that you will read it more and seek the Lord. Because now more than ever, as I mentioned earlier, now more than ever, we need to be in the Word. We need to be drawing closer to God. A lot is happening. And it's happening very, very quickly. And many are going to be caught off guard if they don't start paying attention. All right. Oh, Father God, I just thank you for the lesson. Lord, and I just ask that you would just bless the person that's watching this, that you would just open their eyes, Lord, their mind, their hearts to hear from you, that they would dig into your word, Lord, understand how the Bible is set up. I pray, God, that this has been helpful for somebody, Lord, that it would just uh, ignite a fire in them to want to read your word. Lord, I just thank you for the gentleman that wrote this book. I thank you for how it changed my understanding and helped me, Lord, to be able to draw closer to you. And I just give you all the glory, Father. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me. I hope to see you next time. You take care. Bye-bye.